In this episode of the Smarter Business Podcast, we introduce Paul Greiner as the interviewer. Paul handles BizDev here at VidWheel. And this time, Paul's chatting with Matt Pelkey, partner at Colligan Law, a law firm focused on startup and business law. Paul and Matt talk about management, how to create authentic content marketing that works, and the value of mentorship. If you like what you hear, please subscribe wherever you're taking in this podcast. Share and leave a comment. We're always looking for feedback, and your interaction can help people find this show. Matt, thanks for coming out. Glad to be Appreciate here. you're making the trip. Yeah. In your busy, busy schedule I know you've got going on these days. <clears throat> and what I want to talk about really with Matt is he's a partner from Colligan Law. And beyond just Colligan, who does focus on startup and business law, you've got a whole bunch of other things going on. It's a nice way to put it. <clears throat> and I have to <laughs> stare at my page for this, which is not great form, but uh, I can't remember the title. So you're a partner at Colligan. You are an adjunct professor at the UB School of Law. Yep. You are program director at the UB Entrepreneurial Law Center. Uh, I know we both serve on the board of the Parkside Community Association. Yep. Uh, I believe you're doing some kind of Yale management certificate program. <laughs> Is my spare any, time. Is there anything I'm missing? You know, I do a lot of things in a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I sort of take a very much a, a give first mentality and give back, right? So um, I'm probably at a drop ad period, as I like to call it right now, <laughs> okay. where nothing new gets to come online without something leaving. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, that, that rounds it out pretty nicely. So. Okay. Good, <laughs> good. <laughs> Did a nice job there. Yeah. Um, so on that note, right, having a lot of things going on, I want to talk a little bit about time management. Sure. And, you know, I mean, it's a subject that is of concern for anyone who's got a lot of things going on, or at least it should be. And there's a lot of viewpoints out there. There's a lot of information. I mean, I used to work in doing those kinds of workshops. Yes. And I've seen content you've put out uh, about the subject and with some unique kind of takes on the subject. So Thanks. talk about your philosophy of time management. Yeah, so it's something that I've kind of pieced together by necessity mm -hmm. <laughs> over the last five or so years uh, through some encouragement from my wife as well. Um, but it's been a journey, right? I don't think anyone can say there's one thing that, that works, but I will say one thing that has fundamentally changed how I think about time is I try not to use the word time management. Mm -hmm. um, I really look at it as priorities. Listen, there's time. You have 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of hours and minutes there. Yeah. You can do the math. I don't have it with me here today, yes. but I've done it before. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what it really comes down to is how are you going to spend that time? And when you start thinking about time as, a, as an exercise of priorities, mm -hmm. it starts making you think about things a little bit differently, right? I can now say, you know what? cleaning my house isn't a priority, <laughs> right? Or I can lie to myself and say, I don't have time to clean right. my house. I do, yeah. I have time to clean it, mm -hmm. I can do the laundry. Mm -hmm. I don't, I mm -hmm. choose not to, right? But where it starts getting more difficult is when you start thinking about things like your family and yourself and your professional career, right? I don't have time to go to my kid's basketball game. Going to my kid's basketball game isn't a priority. Mm -hmm. See how that feels different, yeah, right? It's tough to say that out loud. <laughs> and if and if you're in that situation where where you say something isn't a priority, mm -hmm. and that little voice in your head says, "Hmm, this doesn't feel right," yeah, that's kind of a sign to you that well, maybe you need to rethink your priorities. And and a few years ago, that's really what I started doing. Hmm. And I started saying, you know what? Where do I not want to do things because it's not a priority to me? Um, where do I not want to spend my time? And where do I want to spend my time? Where do I want to prioritize it? So so that's sort of a fundamental just shift in how you mm -hmm. think about it. Um, so I would strongly urge people, stop saying you don't have time, you do. Start mm -hmm. thinking about what's a priority and how you wanna prioritize your life and the things that are valuable to you, right? So yourself, your physical health, your mental health, your family, your professional career, mm -hmm. there's a balance to all of that and figuring out what works. As for tips and tricks and things that you know work well, you know there's a lot of stuff out there. You know if you only make right hand turns, you can save five minutes a day. Uh, you know I, <laughs> I haven't heard that one. I might be off on the numbers, but some of them are ridiculous, yeah. right? So did Zoolander I, come up with that one? Because it's can not turn left, Amby I Turner. Or Amber Turner is that it? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
you know, for me, I rely heavily on technology and yeah. a lot of software solutions to manage my time. Um, you know, Calendly has been a huge time saver. Time blocking, so actually mm -hmm. using sort of a manager's time blocking schedule, allotting certain blocks of time to fit into the things that I've sort of identified as a priority. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're not consciously blocking that time off, you're going to use it for yeah. something else, right? Yeah. yeah. Even if it's just, you know what, I'm going to sit down and watch The Office for mm -hmm. an hour. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the risk of not being intentional about your calendar. And don't get me wrong. I was an art and music student growing up, right? So for me, the idea of breaking out blocks of every hour of every day yeah. just felt wrong to me on a fundamental <laughs> level. Mm -hmm. um, but it's made a huge difference in, in how I manage my, my calendar. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I used to actually block off the downtime piece. Oh, yeah. Because otherwise absolutely. that'll disappear too, right? Yeah. And I no block downtime. off time to exercise. I, I uh, only occasionally use it, but yeah. I do block the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, amazing how that one gets blown right by. Um, yeah. Excellent. And one more thing about the time is you had something like no goals as a mantra oh, yeah. for 2019. So say a little bit about that and how it turned out. Yeah, so I last year, I guess it was two years ago now, um, so the end of 2018 coming into 2019, um, I had sort of been in this pattern for several years of sitting down, coming up with quarterly goals, writing them down on a giant dryer erase board that sits in my office at home, and then writing sort of action items and to-do lists. And, you know, we had done that successfully. My wife and I would do it together. We'd hold each other accountable. We'd check mm -hmm. back in halfway through the year. How are you doing? Why didn't you hit a goal? What do you need help with? And and I think that, not that there isn't value in that, I think there is, you know, we've been able to execute and, and do a lot with that system. Mm -hmm. But after a while, you kind of feel like you're just sort of artificially creating goals to create goals. And, you know, oftentimes those can be based around financial incentives, right? So, okay, my business last year was X, I'm just gonna take that root number and add whatever arbitrary percentage that I come right. up with, right? Um, and don't get me wrong, I think there is sort of a, a, a balance of, hey, I need to make sure I have X amount of money to live and survive and, and be a, a happy, healthy human being and provide for my family. But at some point, if that's just the formula you keep following, mm -hmm. it becomes completely empty and meaningless. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, you've got to kind of look for, okay, you know, what do I want to do? this year um, and, and I don't want to keep doing that system and so at the same time I think there was a, a blog post that came out it might have even been on medium and it was like for this year don't set any goals set none and just see what opportunities arise mm -hmm. and follow the things that are you know interesting to you that you're passionate about um, and don't predetermine those things right. And so it was kind of awkward and weird at first. Um, felt very uncomfortable for somebody who had been almost manic about sort of goal setting. Mm -hmm. But I really grew to enjoy it. And it all came online at the same sort of time that I was looking at, okay, let's start pursuing things that are priorities and things that I enjoy. And so it really allowed me to kind of break free of some things that I had attached myself to. Um, and be a lot more open to new experiences and you know and opportunities and, and I didn't know where those would come from necessarily yeah um, but you know it was things that I, I you know I removed that sort of rigid structure mm -hmm. and allowed the creative side of my brain to, to embrace sort of that a little bit more and I think you know it was one of my best years if not the best year I've ever had um, for the businesses I was involved with and am involved with um, you know great year for family and relationships you know I, I really have to look back and think very positively on 2019 now, I'm not saying that that's a direct result of getting rid of all your goals <laughs> but it does sort of make you think right there's sort of this arbitrary you know connection between setting goals or not setting goals and the success and fulfillment that you have yeah. and I think we, we sort of try to build too much around that mm -hmm. and so one of the things I think I've pulled out of this is stop defining you know yourself and your life and and your achievements around this sort of rigid structure and, and be more open to opportunities right yeah that makes sense do not necessarily throw it all out yeah you have I mean, goals <laughs> get clear on them you know but you don't have to have one for everything yeah. 
2020, uh, I, I made a goal to exercise a little more. So, uh, okay. you know, I, I, didn't, <laughs> yes. I didn't fully abandon the goal setting. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, I had mentioned I had seen some time management content. And, you know, I've seen a lot of content from Colligan, from you in particular. Uh, I know I've mentioned this before. I was doing a search online for a totally, I thought, non-related to anything you're doing. Uh, a search on home distilling, which, uh, spoiler alert, not don't, don't do it. It's not legal. It's not safe. I'm not here uh, to give legal advice, but uh, <laughs> yes. it's not, uh, a, not a thing. And when I did the search, a blog post you had done somewhere yeah. uh, came up like second on the search, right? So clearly, you know, as someone who's got content out there uh, and good content, right, not just churning it out because content is king and all those kind of cliches, uh, I'm wondering, how, you know, what pushed you in that direction? What had you early on kind of adopt that model? And, you know, how has it been turning out and where is it going? Yeah, so for me, um, I've always recoiled at sort of the hard sell, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I go to a car dealership and it is the most miserable experience for me, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody approaches me in a, in a sales context, I almost immediately shut down. So it was something I was inherently just sort of drawn away from. And yeah. so looking at, okay, what's the non-sales sales, sales? <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm not sure if that's the phrase for it, but no, that's, yeah, that, you know, that's kind of where I was naturally that's drawn. That's what draws people, yeah. Yeah, and so you know, when I joined Colligan Law, I guess almost six years ago now, mm -hmm. um, one of the first things I asked was, hey, does, does the firm have a marketing committee? And I was like, well, we've got a staff member who has that. I was like, no, like, you know, let's create a committee. Let's get the attorneys involved. Let's make this not just sort of somebody who, who we throw things onto and expect to figure out the world. Let's mm. contribute to this and think about it more holistically. Okay. And so that was really the start of it. Um, and from there, we, we sort of looked to our clients, which is a lot of startups, a lot of technology companies. What were some of the things they were doing, right? Mm. And so we had clients who were, who were creating innovative ways to create content, to disseminate content. And so... I was pretty open to trying to adopt those things and managed to convince my partners to do the same, mm -hmm. um, who continue to tolerate me. So that's Excellent. that's great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but we've been able to go try something, see if it works. If it doesn't work, you know, okay, we tried it, didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had an idea for a video on sous chefs one time. We won't go into that now, but you yes. know, sometimes these ideas work. I sometimes recall. They don't. Yes. <laughs> um, but what we've been able to do is look at where it's worked adopt that, expand it, you know, implement something else. And, yeah. and we sort of build on that foundation as we go along. There's a process in place, we measure those results, and then we hold ourselves accountable. And I think that process obviously is key. Mm -hmm. um, we meet every month, we talk, you know, weekly, um, we work with some professionals as well. And so it's really been, you know, it's been a great process for us. We've really focused on the attorneys themselves as creators. So. I don't know why, but one of the things I just inherently had a problem with was just expecting marketing professionals to do everything with no real connection to the people that are either running or, you know, servicing the clients, yeah. right? There's a disconnect there if you try to do that. I think a lot of law firms tend to take that approach where, you know, we hire a marketing director and no offense to marketing directors. Yes. Some of you are my friends. Definitely, definitely not. Um, but you have to have that sort of holistic engagement with the businesses itself. Yeah. Understand the problems, understand the challenges, understand what content is relevant. So we actually created a, a one page sort of questionnaire for our attorneys and it really helps them identify what their personal brand is, what their goals are, what their vision is, what their strengths are. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, kind of sounds cheesy and, and maybe like, you know, why would you do this in a law firm? But this isn't something that you're taught in law school. This isn't something that most law firms, you know, really even look at, you know, yeah. usually you pay somebody tens of thousands of dollars to come tell you this, mm -hmm. right? But what we wanted to do is break it down on the individual attorney level and say, well, what are your interests? You know, what are your strengths? What do you, what do you want to create? Mm. And then once we've gone through that exercise and help them identify that, we then help them create a content plan around that and really encourage them to push out thought leadership content, push out timely matters, whether that be through relevant legislation or changes in the law or changes in business. And you know, so far it's worked really, really well. Um, it is by far where we focus most of our sort of business development efforts in. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, knock on wood, it's, you know, worked fairly well for us thus far. Um, right, so, so you, <laughs> you all are on the rise, so clearly yeah. it's... you know, we've been on the fast track company list the last two years. Um, we'll see what happens this year. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think we should, we should at least be competitive. And mm -hmm. so that has really been 
the driving force behind that content creation. And, um, you know, really it started out as a sort of committee idea and then created a process and a system around that and holding ourselves accountable. You know, I think that's oftentimes in marketing where people kind of fall short is you can have a consultant come in, come up with a grand plan. And then if there's nobody there actually executing on right. that plan, yeah. and it's easy for attorneys to just sort of disregard, you know, a staff member who asks you to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I never do that. But, no, no. Um, you know, I think when it's, when it's a committee and a group of people and you've got partners and associates who are invested in that process yeah. and have helped create that plan, mm -hmm. you know, then we all sort of hold ourselves accountable, right? Like, mm -hmm. we were going to do this. Where are we at? Why aren't we there? And yeah. then work through it. So, cool. Yeah. All right. So our theme question, every episode we ask this question, what is one thing, one key thing you've done that has made your business smarter? So I think what we've done at Colligan is really be open to learning and to innovating, not just the practice of law, but the business of law. Hmm. And it's okay to think or admit or even talk about the fact that you don't know all the answers, right? And I don't pretend to. And so a lot of what we've done has come from looking to other businesses, other industries, other countries even, um, and looking at what those best practices are being intentional about looking at what's worked well elsewhere, mm -hmm. you know, taking it back, adopting it, um, creating intentional time to learn those things, right? Yeah. So we twice a year, you know, send people to conferences that are really about innovation and the management and the business side of law. It has very little to do with the actual practice of law. Mm -hmm. In fact, very rarely do these conferences have anything to do with, you know, okay. what the case law is in a particular right. jurisdiction, right? But they're all about what are firms across the globe doing? What are businesses across, across the globe doing? And so we look to that. We're open to learning, educating ourselves. And I think for us, that's really made a huge difference, right? That's been our value add. It's allowed us to grow. Um, and so we always are continuously looking for those new ideas and execute them. Cool. All right, last up. Sure. Open-ended. This is your opportunity. <laughs> you can pitch yourself. You can shout something out, make a recommendation. What do you want to let our viewers know? So, you know, shout out, um, you know, really to everybody in the entrepreneurial community and the startup community. I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how, uh, you know, I've met a lot of the professionals I work with, a lot of the clients I work with. Um, you know, it's, it's really a group effort, right? Um, you know, if you look 10 years ago, you know, there was maybe, you know, 10 people at Open Coffee Club and the community really has come a long way and it's yeah. been through a lot of changes right over the years. And it's been great to have played a small role in a lot of different pieces of that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you haven't gotten involved in the startup community yet, please do. Um, you can check out Open Coffee Club every Tuesday morning. Um, you know, there's a lot of events out there to just sort of get your feet wet. If you're interested in starting a business, mm -hmm. please do. So that's that's sort of the startup piece. Okay. It's obviously what I'm passionate about. Um, piece of advice, if you don't have a mentor or a coach, get one. Um, for me, you know, looking back, whether intentionally or not, I've always had a mentor, mm -hmm. uh, whether I called it a mentor or not. You know, there was always somebody that I sort of went to and, yeah. and could talk about and, you know, share my insecurities and fears and things I wanted to do and whatever. Um, but it really helps hold yourself accountable mm -hmm. and sort of push yourself forward and have somebody to talk about. Um, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a mentor, you know, which I've tried to keep in mind, you know, for the last seven or eight years was I was thinking about making a, a change. And I sat down with a mentor and I said, you know, well, I'm really comfortable where I am right now. She cut me off immediately. Like, you have no business being comfortable. Go be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Go take risks. Go make mistakes. Go learn from those and grow. And frankly, you know, if you're just starting out at your career, if you're in college, if you're just graduating college, that's a great time to make mistakes. Now, you know, don't make them too large of mistakes, right? Don't have them in jail. Um, but in terms of business and in terms of professional development, you can take risks that are mm -hmm. easier to take when you're younger, right? Yeah. It doesn't, for the most part, you don't reduce your risk the older you get, right? <laughs> yeah. You have family, you have spouses, mm -hmm. you have mortgages, you have kids, you have animals, you know, these things sort of start adding to that, that risk tolerance, yeah. um, you know, where it's, well, it's no longer just me making a decision, right? But if you're in that situation, right, don't be afraid to take a chance. 
Buffalo is a great community for for risk, and I don't think that gets talked about a lot. But you can sure. you can start something here, try, fail miserably, mm-hmm. <laughs> right, and your world won't come crashing down. Yeah, right. You can start over again. You can pivot to something else, and you're not going to have to file bankruptcy, right? Mm-hmm. You can. There's a relatively low cost of living here. The community is very supportive, right? And and you don't always get that in larger cities, right? You can't make that same level of mistake maybe in New York or San Francisco yeah. and, and stay there, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think for me, you know, that's always been a huge sort of philosophical uh, approach that I've had. You know, don't have a fear of failing. Mm. You know, people tend not to take chances because they're terrified of well, what if I don't succeed, right? And, and I always hate to hear that, right? There are plenty of people who fail. Most businesses fail. A yeah. vast majority of them fail, right? Um, it's not really failure unless you just give up and stop, right? right? Mm-hmm. So you can learn from those mistakes. You can grow from it. Um, you know, I've started businesses. Some of them have worked out. Some of them haven't. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what, I've learned more in business from the ones that haven't than the ones that are necessarily going really, really well. Um, you know, sometimes they're painful lessons, but you know what? We as people grow from that, yeah, right? You remember um, those ones. <laughs> you remember those. <laughs> and there's a lot of personal growth in adversity and pain. And, yeah. you know, people don't necessarily like to talk about that, but, but it's true. And yeah. I think so getting a more comfortable level with the idea of failure and growing from it is important, right? Yeah. Learn from your mistakes, try again, continue on. Um, lastly, and this kind of ties in at least loosely, uh, it's just a book that I've been recommending lately. Uh, actually came from my own coach, um, but through some conversations with businesses, entrepreneurs, startup founders, um, it seemed timely and relevant to a lot of sort of challenges that people were facing. It's a book called Reboot by Jerry Colonna. Uh, it's about leadership, the art of growing up, kind of talks about a or at least it's premised on this idea of sort of radical self-inquiry, right? Mm. Um, figuring out, you know, who you are as a person, really becoming very comfortable and honest with yourself about that, mm-hmm. really before you can take a step forward and effectively lead other people. And so that's sort of the concept behind it, right? Yeah. Um, a real sort of sincere level of leadership and, and development. And so those are sort of the things that, I spend some time thinking about mm-hmm. and uh, encouraging others to look at. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's probably it. Sounds worth it. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks cool. for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming out, doling out some wisdom, sharing yeah. some of your experiences. And if you want to check out more about Matt's or about certainly about Colligan, you can go to colliganlaw.com. And uh, yeah, good to see you again, bud. Thanks. Yeah. Good seeing you. Thanks. That wraps up this episode. To learn more about Matt and Colligan, head over to colliganlaw.com. Thanks for checking us out. Subscribe and comment on this episode to help us grow our audience.